Hello and welcome back to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall of Bearded Kendall and I will be your host as always and I have been itching to make this episode since I saw Saturday's race. <laughs> Absolutely itching. Um, gosh, where to start? Um, well, let's start with an overall view. Uh, Winton was our latest race. Uh, we've been waiting three weeks since the uh, Perth Super Night for this one. And um, it was definitely full of penalties. Let's, <laughs> let's say that. It wasn't short of controversy. Um, the actual races themselves weren't that exciting, though. Um, there wasn't... It, it'll definitely be one that's remembered, but uh, not really for the right reasons. Um, so let's go into one of those... One of those reasons why it won't be remembered for a pleasant reason. And the main reason for that is I'm gonna go I'm just gonna start it right off at the start. So if you just if you just want to hear me talk about this bit, um McLaughlin and Coulthard's clash at turn five on lap one of the Saturday race. So Let's just paint a picture in case you, for some reason, like forgot or haven't seen it or whatever. Um, so it's the start of the race. McLaughlin qualified further behind. I think he started in fifth. Um, Coulthard started in first. He got a bad start, got overtaken by a few people. And coming up to turn five, which is the short, the long left-hander, um, McLaughlin is on the outside of Coulthard. And he's going a little bit faster. They're, they're directly alongside each other. Coming into the braking zone, um, Kulta puts the brakes on uh, earlier and harder because he's going around. He's going up the inside, so he needs to he needs to carry less speed. Otherwise, he'll turn into McLaughlin. McLaughlin brakes later. He goes around the outside and he pretty much has the move made when he turns into Kulta and he hits him. Um, now this isn't really. Scott's fault, he didn't know that there was still an overlap there, um, but the result is that he hits Coulthard and they both go off, um, they both go off the track at turn five. Um, Coulthard slows the car right up and he rejoins, um, he rejoins at the back of the field, uh, after turn five. Um, Scotty goes across uh, the infield, and he actually rejoins the track at turn 8. So he cuts three corners out. Um, now, <laughs> he did redress his position. So he came out in first, and he slowed up and let David Reynolds and James Courtney pass. And obviously this was the right thing to do. Uh, so we redressed back into third, um, which was fine. Um... But this obviously, <laughs> this obviously wasn't a very popular move because he, what he essentially did was cut across um, a large chunk of the circuit, really, um, in order to retain position. Um, and it's brought up a lot of questions of of um, what what you should be allowed to do in order to redress uh, an incident, especially one that has been deemed to not be your fault. Um, but we'll keep going with the official with what officially happens. Um, so later on, it's investigated, and Coulthard is given a 15-second penalty for uh, sending McLaughlin off. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of things to analyze in this incident. So there's a... Okay, there's a couple of things. So the first thing is whether or not McLaughlin should be allowed to go across... Or anyone should be allowed to cut across the track and then redress um, a redress an issue, uh, especially if they haven't caused it themselves. So someone else has sent them off, and they're simply uh, getting back to their position. Um, because if you if the answer to that is yes, a driver should be allowed to cut across those turns and retain their position, then you could apply that to anywhere or any track. Um, so the last time this happened was 2015 at Darwin where David Reynolds did something similar and he wasn't penalised, but the next year they did 
make the rules on cutting across that part of the track much more strict, which I feel like is what they'll try to do next year at Winton as well. Um, but the fact that this sort of thing is still coming up is uh, a problem in and of itself because it could happen again. Um, so the bigger question there is whether or not you think a driver should be allowed to cut across a track in order to maintain position. Um, and I, I don't like the idea of a driver driving across and cutting out swaths, swaths, uh, large portions of a track, we'll just avoid that word, <laughs> cutting out large portions of a track, um, just to maintain position, even if the incident isn't their fault, because that's racing. If you have an accident, you can't just cut, you can't just cut across the track and say, and then redress your position and be fine. Um, because, I mean, all sorts of things could, could, you know, you could lead to all sorts of very strange ruling decisions when you start bringing these sort of questions up. Like, um, on that, uh, later in that race, Simona was spun around by, um, ooh, I don't even remember who it was, Macaulay Jones, I think, um, on lap two or three, um, out of the final corner. Um, so that wasn't her fault, um... But should she then be allowed to, um, like, cut across through the infield and rejoin, like, cut across through the infield, rejoin at turn eight, like McLaughlin did, from the last corner, and then just redress back to where she was? Is she allowed to do that? No, she's not allowed to do that into the rules, because that'd be ridiculous, but isn't that... You start talking about these sorts of things when you allow a driver to do what Scotty did. Um... It sort of damages the integrity of shortcutting, basically. It sort of brings up the question of whether or not drivers are allowed to shortcut. Um, and drivers are going to do whatever they can to finish as high as possible. So if one of them goes off and there's a precedent for drivers cutting across the track, rejoining somewhere else and, re and redressing, um, they're going to see that and they're going to see that it's okay to do that and they're going to do it. Like, <laughs> it's going to happen. Um just like how it happened with David Reynolds in 2015 and how it's come up later, um, the same thing could happen again very easily in the future unless more stringent rules are placed around the concept in general. Now, that being said though, it is specifically stated in the rules thanks to a video that Scott McLaughlin uploaded on his Twitter, which you can find for yourself. Um that drivers going off at turn five are allowed to rejoin the track before the turn nine flag post, which he did, which he did do. Um, so he didn't break any rules, which is fine. Um, but that's not really the issue I have. The issue I have is that drivers are allowed to cut that portion of the track no matter what, you know, <laughs> like it, it, I'm inherently against the idea of, of drivers cutting large portions of a track out in order to, um, correct an error that someone else made or, to fix their own mistake or anything like that. Um, I think this conversation would be a lot different if 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 uh, if the incident had been deemed Scotty's fault rather than Fabian's fault, because then Scotty would be gaining an advantage on a mistake that he'd made. Um, so yeah, the overall qu the bigger question here is whether or not you should you think the drivers are whether or not drivers should be allowed to corner to corner cut basically in order to regain a position that they have lost from no fault of their own. Um, and I just think that it turns it into a little bit of a joke if drivers are allowed to do that. Um, I think that should definitely be clamped down on. Um, but, and I don't think this would happen with very many other tracks, and the reason why, the reason why is even from... Um, I think even, even Scotty said this himself, and I wish I could find it, <laughs> I've lost the quote, um, here it is, so, uh, Scotty even said in an interview to Supercars, um, that the main reason why he cut across the track, and I think I'll just read it out for me, for you, um, uh, when he was asked whether or not it was fair to take a shortcut and win, McLaughlin said, it's a hard question because I felt like I had so much momentum going off, which is true. One thing for me is for next year, I don't know what they're going to do, and it's been there for ages, is the ditches in the infield. 
that was a big problem in this case and then obviously wet grass slick tires i was going off there at a rate of knots um this uh, can't agree more with this the, the you can see it on the onboard too if you watch um supercars has cut together a very good onboard of um fabian and scotty's car from fabian and scotty's cars as the incident happens um, which i recommend you watch if you're at all interested uh you can find it on their their twitter page if you are looking for it but um it does show scotty driving through the ditch in the infield um because of the way the track is shaped and because of that ditch it's really not possible for scotty to slow the car up and actually turn it in back in towards the track because he's gone off on a left-hander and the track ultimately goes right um once he crossed that ditch he couldn't really go back through it to rejoin um and if he had rejoined further up he would have been rejoining perpendicular to the road which would have been very unsafe which he does go on to say later down here and i don't have a problem with the way that he's rejoined the track uh in and of itself but i do think that winton is unique in that it has a hazard on the infield like that uh, which is the ditch um and that once you cross it you can't really go back through it otherwise you'll just get stuck um so he's found himself in a bit of a no man's land and he did the right thing he rejoined at a safe part of the track and he redressed um i don't have any problems with that it's more that <laughs> it's more it's a couple of things but it's more that it's okay in the rules for drivers to do stuff like that and it it it's kind of worries me it sets a it sets a bit of a it sets a bit of annoying not annoying um troublesome precedent that in the future a driver, a driver might do this somewhere else um and they might point to what happened here with scotty and be like well he got away with it um but hopefully it never comes to that um so that's the first portion of this whether or not you think drivers should be allowed to shortcut at all um the next the next problem that you need to look at is whether or not it was actually fabian coulthard's fault so he did receive a 15 second penalty for contact with scott mclaughlin but i've watched um i've watched the onboard cameras from both of their their cars multiple times especially fabian's um and it really doesn't look like something he could have avoided <laughs> it really doesn't um he comes up to turn five he breaks much earlier than scotty because he knows he's there and he's trying to avoid steering into him so he's already he's already he's already you know he's aware he's there and he's already done his best to try and avoid him um he's right up on top of the curb so his left side of the car is on the curb um and by the and then scotty comes alongside of him and starts turning in now fabian could have backed out more by breaking harder but this is a hard thing to this is this is a hard thing to um to say to a driver to do because he has braked harder and earlier and that's how scotty's managed to get around him on the outside in the first place um so he has done that and scotty is ahead um fabian doesn't steer into him he doesn't steer into into scotty it's not like he carries some some understeer and drives into the side of him scott scott cuts him off and drives into fabian um and Fabian didn't do anything. He's just driving around the corner. Um, yeah, he could have backed out of it, and uh, it is Scotty's corner, but it's not like Fabian... Most of the time when we talk about drivers backing out of a out of a corner because someone else is further along, it's usually because the driver that needs to back out is the one that's being too aggressive. They've gone... They've gone for a move and they've only got a little bit of their nose up the inside and the other driver can't possibly see that and then they run into each other. This is the opposite. This is where the driver who is further along is the aggressive driver. Um, and he's going along the outside and he's turned into the defending driver. Um, if Fabian had been on the inside and he had turned into Scotty, um, 100%, it'd be his fault. 100% um but he's he hasn't done that he's just driving around the corner and scotty's turned into him um i don't really know what fabian's meant to do about that he could try and back out of it once he understands that scotty is turning into him but he doesn't have long to react to that so he has two options he can either he can either put on the brakes 
which could potentially cause him to understeer and then actually run into Scotty, uh, which would achieve the same result. Or he could roll out of the accelerator and just try and roll slow, uh, and try and roll, just roll the car, which would scrub some speed and hopefully avoid him. But the amount of time he has, like he doesn't have a lot of time between Scotty actually turning in, beginning to turn in and actually hitting him. And some of that time has to be dedicated to Fabian actually realizing that Scotty's going to turn into him. Um, and even if he does roll out of the accelerator, I don't think there's enough time for him to slow up enough for Scotty not to hit him. Um, I think a 15 second penalty is really harsh. If you're going to penalize him, like five seconds. Um, but for me, it's it's absolutely 100% a racing incident. It, it Like, Scotty didn't know that Fabian was still there. Um, Fabian didn't think that Scotty was going to turn in on him. Like, I don't really see how that's Fabian's fault. Um, he didn't do anything wrong. I mean... Yeah, he, he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't, he didn't defend the corner at all. He didn't try and stop Scotty. He didn't try to push him out wide or anything. He's right in on the inside, as far in as you can go. He doesn't turn into him, and Scotty just... Scotty runs into, runs into him. He doesn't realize there's still an overlap, and that's just... That's Scotty's mistake. That's Scotty's error. Um, I really don't see how it's Fabian's fault. I don't really know what he could have done. And to me, because it's, a, it's, it's lap one... There's cars everywhere, um, cold tires, cold brakes, all that stuff. Um, you need to be more lenient of, of incidents because they're going to happen. They always happen. on. In, if an incident's going to happen, it's going to be on lap one. Um, and this was just an example of that. Uh, it was two drivers. One was trying to overtake the other and just didn't realize that he was still had his little bit of a, little bit of a nose in there. And it's not like Fabian meant for his nose to be in there. He didn't want Scotty to turn it on him. But he couldn't do anything about it. He didn't. He can't control Scotty turning into him. Um, and like I said, if he had tried to roll out of it or put on the brakes, he might have ended up hitting him anyway. So what can he do? You know, um, I think fifteen seconds is in ridiculously harsh for an incident like this. Um, to me, it's a straight up and down racing incident. I don't think either driver is really at fault for what happened here. And I think it's just an unfortunate incident. Like it's just something that happens in racing. Um, and you live and you learn and you move on. Now, if this had been a racing incident, would Scotty have been able to cut across the track the way he did and get away with it? Um, or if Scotty had been penalised, would be allowed? Would he be allowed to go across the track and not get penalised the way he did, even with the redress? And these are all questions that we will never get the answer to. We'll never know if Scotty would have gotten a penalty... Um, had it been deemed a racing incident, or even if it was deemed his own, as his own fault. Um, but for me, um, basically the short of it is, I don't think that 15 seconds is, is valid. I, I, that's incredibly harsh for something that Fabian basically did nothing to do. <laughs> he just kind of sat there. Um, he didn't instigate it. He wasn't attacking, he was defending. And he didn't steer into him he doesn't move his steering wheel he's turning left the whole time you know um there's not a whole lot he can do he can't go any further left he will drive off the road um he tried breaking harder to make sure he made the corner and not run into scotty and scotty just drove into him there's not like in any other circumstance if if that was a straightaway and not a corner and scotty was alongside him like that and drove into him and tried to cut him off and didn't realize he was still there, it would be a racing incident. Scotty would go off and Fabian wouldn't have done anything wrong. Like, you don't have to back out of a corner just because someone else is there. You don't have to do that. That's not racing. You don't have to let someone through just because their car is most of the way alongside you if they're attacking you. If you're attacking them and you haven't made it and you're on the inside of a corner, yeah, you should probably back out because you haven't made the, you haven't made the overtake. You haven't made it work. Um, and then you're being dangerous if you're just sticking it, sticking your nose in places where it shouldn't be. Like drivers can't see that. If you suddenly stick your nose in there, they're going to hit it. You know, this isn't what happened. This is the opposite. Fabian's defending on the inside, and Scotty's driven into him. Fabian had nothing to do with with Scotty being there. 
Um, he didn't try to outbreak him into the corner. In fact, he tries to let him through, and you can see that by how early he breaks. Um, I just, yeah. Fabian did, I don't think Fabian did anything wrong in that incident. I really don't. Um, he could he could have done a little bit more, and Scotty could have done a little bit more, and for me, that makes it 100% a racing incident. So that's two things. Whether or not Scotty should have been penalised for going off and whether or not he should be allowed to, anyone should be allowed to go off and take a corner and redress their situation. Whether or not Fabian deserved the penalty that he got. And my third issue is the consistency for penalties. One lap one lap later, I think it was, Reynolds, he, he sticks a nose up the inside of Courtney at turn four. Corny can't possibly see him because he stuck the tiniest part of his car up there, turns into him to try and make the corner, and nearly sends him off, Reynolds. Nearly sends Reynolds off. Uh, ne- Reynolds nearly sends Courtney off because he had his nose stuck in there. So this is a this is the exact same thing as between Fabian and Scotty, except this time, Reynolds is the aggressor. He's the one on the inside, and he's now the aggressor, right? So because Reynolds is on the inside and he's chosen to make that move and stick his nose in there and Courtney's turned into him not knowing he'd be there, that is 100% Reynolds' fault. Okay, so the difference is that Scotty knew Fabian was there and Scotty turned into Fabian. Um, and Fabian didn't instigate the move. With Reynolds and Courtney, Reynolds instigated the move on Courtney. He was behind Courtney. He didn't make the corner. He didn't, he didn't make it far enough alongside for Courtney to see he was there, and then Courtney ran into him because he didn't know he was there. That's Reynolds' fault. Um, and Reynolds, even though this should be a clear slam dunk that Reynolds drove Courtney off the track, and Courtney lost a few places because of it, Reynolds received a 5-second time penalty versus Fabian's 15-second time penalty. And... I can't figure out why. I really can't. I mean, there's a couple of ways you can dish out penalties. One is to have... This is the incident, and this incident deserves this penalty. So, if the incident is um, a driver has stuck their nose up the inside of a car and ran into another car, because this is both the same incident, in theory, when you boil it down to something that simple, um, then... A 15 second time penalty is what has been established one lap prior. So Reynolds should have gotten a 15 second time penalty. But that's not what happened. So they can't be looking at it as a blanket thing. They must be looking at it individually. All right. So let's look at it individually. In Scott and Fabian's case, Scotty went spearing off in the infield. Yeah. Um, and I suppose you could interpret that as being a more dangerous move. But, also, it's just a big empty infield. There's nothing in there. Scotty cut across to the other side of the track, and he redressed back to the position that he was in when he, when he left it. So he didn't lose any spots. And he was at no point in danger. He wasn't going to crash. There's nothing in the infield for him to crash into. And Fabian went to the back of the grid, so he'd already lost a ton of positions during the whole process. Meanwhile, Reynolds makes this move on Courtney for first. On the second lap, um, he's the aggressor. And he sends Courtney off and Courtney loses a bunch of spots and Reynolds loses nothing. So on a case-by-case basis, Reynolds has gained an advantage from that. And Fabian has gained nothing but a disadvantage from his, from his scenario. But somehow... Despite them being identical incidences and Reynolds gaining an advantage and Fabian not gaining an advantage, Fabian received 10 more seconds to his penalty than Reynolds did. I really can't work out why. I really don't. I really don't understand it. Um, Reynolds made a super aggressive move. He was bumping Courtney down the straight and stuck his nose in on as Courtney was making a turn and Courtney ran into him. It's 100% Reynolds' fault and he deserved a penalty and he got one, but he deserved a penalty that was at least equal to or more than Fabian's. Because what Fabian did to Scotty doesn't even match up to what happened to Courtney. And that was only one lap later. Like, it's not like it was the next day. 
um, or a different race. It was the same race one lap afterwards. Like, I don't understand who made these decisions. It it really does baffle me because if you look, if you boil it down to just sending someone off and trying to gain an advantage from that, Reynolds made a move that wasn't on, and he gained a very clear advantage for the lead of the race, putting his um, putting the car that was defending back several positions in a way that Courtney would never be able to compete for the lead again. Fabian, according to the stewards, is at fault for hitting Scotty. But Scotty didn't lose any positions. Fabian lost a ton of spots. And Fabian gets the harsher penalty than Reynolds. I'm sorry, but I, I just don't understand the logic behind it. I really can't follow it. Um, those weren't the only penalties, though. Um, Oldsworth copped two penalties on the same day. So, Lee Holdsworth copped two 15-second time penalties, one during the race and one post-race for contact with Anton on lap 22 and contact with Jacobson on lap um, 13. Um, which, I mean, 15-second 15, 15 penalty is a, is a pretty harsh penalty. And it happened before his contact with, with Anton. And Race Control missed it during the race, apparently. They, it only came up when Kelly Racing lobbied it to them. Um, not sure how they missed that one. <laughs> it was a pretty major incident. And he got he got done with careless driving, which is... like That's one of the harsher penalties you can get. Careless driving, 15 seconds. Like... <laughs> you know, that was weird. Um, and the one between Macaulay Jones and Simona... Um, Di Silvestro wasn't looked at until after the race as well. Um, so that was the one where Simona got spun around on like the end of lap one, um, and that was deemed as being a uh, as a racing incident. Um, <laughs> I don't. It's just I don't know. It's just the when when. When penalties start becoming inconsistent, um, you begin to question pretty much everything the stewards dish out. Um, so, that happened to Holdsworth on the same day. Um, I think that was all the penalties that happened on the Saturday, although there might be more. There was some on Sunday as well. Um, but that was the big event that happened. That was the big thing that happened. The contact between Coulthard and McLaughlin. Um, and I really think it was unfair on Coulthard, the penalty he got. Um, and clearly he got a talking to from his team before the end of the race because um, on the radio he was very upset that Scotty cut across the track and uh, he had redressed properly, in quotation marks. Um... And by the end of the race, when he pops out of the car and he's interviewed, he's uh, he's all, oh, it was my fault. I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. Scotty's allowed to do that. So clearly his team has told him he's in the wrong. Um, and pretty much everyone sided against him, which I felt really bad for him because I really, I really think it was very harsh on him. He went all the way to the back of the field. He still copped the 15-second time penalty, and Scotty lost nothing. Uh, meanwhile, Reynolds does... A very aggressive, opportunistic move on Courtney. It doesn't pay off for him. Courtney gets sent to the back of the field. Reynolds gains first position. Reynolds gets a five-second time penalty. Um, sorry, Courtney gets sent backwards through the field, not back to the end of the field. Um, it really doesn't make any sense to me. It really doesn't. Um, but in the end, basically, in the rules, it says that Scotty could cut across, could, could cut across the infield. Um, I don't think that's a very good rule. Um... But Scotty did nothing wrong, so I don't want to. I don't want to say that um, that Scotty deserved. It. Initially, I thought Scotty deserved a penalty for cutting across so much of the track. Um, now that I'm aware that the drivers were specifically briefed about that corner and told that they could cut across if they needed to, um, he did nothing wrong in that instance. Um, I don't think he did anything 
particularly wrong with the contact with Fabian either, but I also don't think Fabian did anything in particularly particularly wrong, I believe. Very firmly it was a racing incident. Um, and I don't believe Fabian deserved a penalty. I don't believe Scotty deserved a penalty. I certainly don't think he deserves um, any vitriol, so don't, don't message him or tweet at him or whatever, because I know that that did happen. Um, so please don't do that. Um, drivers make decisions in, in a split second. They're not, they're not scheming and conniving and planning things out from, from the beginning of the weekend. These things happen and they have to make a choice straight away. And in the end, Scotty did what he did for safety reasons. And you, you have to acknowledge that that's true because if he had tried to rejoin anywhere else, he would have been perpendicular to the track and it would have been very dangerous. Um, really the penalty would have been made to put him back where he rightfully in finger quotes belonged. Um, so that was the only reason why I thought a penalty was due at the time I realise now that that's not the case because uh, the rules specifically state that you can do that and if the rules specifically state that then that he's just doing what the rules say he can't, he's not responsible for what the rules say he's there to follow them um, I do believe the rule needs to be looked at though um, but <laughs> I'm going to stop talking about that now because it's been like 30 minutes and I need to actually talk about the race so let's talk about the race. Now that we've gotten all the controversial things out of the way, let's have a look at the race results. Well, let's look at qualifying first. So qualifying for race 13 on the Saturday was Chaz Mostert on pole position by two and a half tenths. Good job to him on a mixed condition track. He, did, he made the most of it for sure. Uh, Coulthard in second, David Reynolds in third, James Courtney in fourth. Excellent job from him. Good to see uh, Welcome Short and Dreddy up uh, in the pointy end of the top ten. Scott McLaughlin in fifth. Uncharacteristically, uh, not so great for Scotty in qualifying. Uh, perhaps the mixed conditions threw him off a bit. Um, Winterbottom in sixth. Good job. Scott Pye in seventh. Gary Jacobson in his home race in eighth position. His best this year. Remember, he is a rookie. Excellent job from him. Really, really impressive. And James Golding in knife deserves just as much recognition. Again, really impressive from him as well. Especially considering that both of them were ahead of Jamie Winkup, who only qualified in 10th position. Red Bull having a terrible weekend. Uh, Cameron Waters in 11th. Shane Van Gisbergen in 12th. He had an awful time as well. Um... Anton Di Pasquale in 13th, Lee Holdsworth in 14th, Rick Kelly in 15th, Ford Davison in 16th, Nick Perkat in 17th, Richie Stanaway, excuse me, Richie Stanaway with a crook neck um, in 18th, um, doing his best, but felt really bad for the guy on Saturday. Uh, Tim Slade in 19th, terrible time for BJR, um, considering it's their home race, that's unfortunate. Macaulay Jones in 20th, Andre Heimgarten in 21st, Simona in 22nd, Todd Hazelwood in 23rd, Jack Smith, another wildcard entrant in 24th, and Jack LeBrock in 25th. Um, three seconds adrift of Jack Smith uh, because they bolted slicks on his car when the track wasn't even remotely dry. Um, but, you know, you have to be in it to win it and <laughs> good on them for trying a different strategy just in case it worked out because they might have been heroes, you know? They might have been they might have been heroes had it paid off. Unfortunately, it didn't. But into the race, Scott McLaughlin in first, followed by Chaz Moster in second. David Reynolds in third. James Courtney in fourth. Shane Van Gisbergen up seven spots to fifth. He did a really good job. Uh, they did an excellent job with, their, with his strategy. Jamie Winkup as well up four spots to six. Nick Perka up ten spots to seventh, and Andre Heimgartner up thirteen spots to eighth. He had an amazing time. Both of them did. Um, Mark Winterbottom in 9th Scott Pye in 10th uh, Cameron Waters in 11th Will Davison in 12th up 4 spots Tim Slade up 6 spots in the 13th Rick Kelly in 14th Fabian Coulthard obviously down 13 spots with that 15 time second 15 second penalty and the contact with Scotty at the start of the race um, Nicole Jones in 16th up 4 spots James Golding in 17th don't really know what happened to James Golding or why he dropped so many spots um Anton had contact with Holdsworth, so he finished in 18th. Todd Hazelwood in 19th. Jack LeBrock in 20th. Uh, Gary Jacobson, he had contact with Holdsworth as well in 21st. Unfortunate to see such a good qualifying result go to a little bit of waste. Um, Lee Holdsworth in 22nd after being given two 30-second time penalties. Simona 
had first up contact with Macaulay Jones. She finished in 23rd. Jack Smith in 24th. And Richie Stanaway in 25th. Um, I don't remember why. I believe that he did have an issue. I think. From memory. Um, I can't remember what it was though. But both Jack Smith and Richie Stanaway finished a lap down. Very unfortunate for Richie Stanaway. Um, with his neck problems. Which he assured everybody would be fine for the race. But as it turns out... It was not, because we move into qualifying for the Sunday event with Scott McLaughlin in first place by five tenths. That's half a second faster than second place. Um, <laughs> will somebody stop this man? <laughs> it's, it's getting ridiculous and rather depressing. Uh, it's really turned into the Scott McLaughlin show this year. Um, I thought last year was a bit humdrum. Um, this this time of year, last year, he'd won a lot of races. Um, this year, he's won more races so far, I think 10, than he won in the entirety of last year. He won nine races last year total, over the whole year. This year, he's won 10, I'm pretty sure. Already. <laughs> We're only up to race 14. <laughs> that's all of them except for four that's crazy absolutely crazy one of those he was taken out by Cameron Waters um, I just I, <laughs> I'm speechless absolutely speechless we're witnessing a domination that we haven't seen since the early Triple Eight days um, yeah it's I mean, he's a great driver and props to him, to, props to him for doing everything right. Um, but as a neutral, it's really quite depressing to watch. <laughs> I just want to watch good racing and I'm not getting any of it. Uh, as for Fabian, he's really the only person who can take it to Scotty in theory because they're in the same team and he's really not doing that, um, especially in qualifying. Uh, and, but not even in race, you know, he hasn't been particularly aggressive versus Scotty in any race, really. Uh, he doesn't seem to me like a guy who's fighting for a championship. He seems like a number two, um, and I don't want that. If one team's dominating, I don't want. I don't want. A, I don't want a number one and then a number two and then the number one wins all the time. That's boring as hell. <laughs> um, so, um, his contract's up at the end of this year. Um, I, yeah. I would like to see him go, honestly, at this stage. Um, just because, as a neutral, I want to see racing at the front, and then therefore I think Scotty should have a teammate that actually can fight him. Um, but um, can, for their team goals, Fabian's doing fine. It's been one-twos for ages, you know? Like, he's doing, he's filling that number two role pretty well. Um, so you never know. Maybe they just want a number two driver. Who knows? Uh, but back to the results. It's Jamie Winkup in third, less than a tenth back from Fabian. See, if you get rid of Scotty, it's actually a really close championship all of a sudden. <laughs> if you just get rid of him, it's actually like really exciting again. Um, David Reynolds in fourth, Chaz Moster in fifth, Anton Di Pasquale in sixth, Will Davison in seventh, Lee Holdsworth with his best qualifying results in eighth, which is a bit shocking to say, but there you go. Uh, Cameron Waters in ninth, and Andre Heimgartner just squeaking into the top 10. Great job from him. Uh, Nick Perkett in 11th, Rick Kelly in 12th, Shane Van Gisbergen in 13th. He had an awful qualifying session. Um, we just battling. You, you could see on some of the onboards, he was absolutely fighting that car around the track. Um, absolutely fighting it. He just didn't have any grip. He, oversteering, understeering everywhere. Um... Scott Pye in 14th and James Courtney in 15th. Um, disappointing to see them back down out of the top 10 again, but swings and roundabouts. Uh, James Courtney in 16th, Mark Winterbottom in 17th, Macaulay Jones in 18th, Tim Slade in 19th. Another awful qualifying session for him. Uh, Tol Hazelwood in 20th, 21st for Gary Jacobson, 22nd for Simona, 23rd for Jack Smith, 24th for Jack LeBrock, and 25th and last position for Chris Piffer. Um, normally a Super 2 driver who is filling in for Richie Stanaway on the Sunday race because of his neck. 
So it turns out he'd succumbed to his neck injuries. Um, and Chris Piffer had to take over. Um, so let's talk about how Chris Piffer did, as well as everybody else, in the race results. Uh, Scott McLaughlin in first, and Fabian Coulthard in second. I feel like I don't even need to say that. <laughs> in fact, the top four didn't move. Uh, Jamie Winkup in third, and David Reynolds in fourth. Uh, Lee Holdsworth in fifth, his best finish yet. Good job. Uh, it's been a while coming. I've been a bit of a naysayer with Lee Holdsworth. If he can keep this up for the next couple of rounds... Uh, those, those, that criticism I've been saying of him will be gone. It'll be gone. If he can keep this up, perfect. Uh, Cameron Waters in six. Shane Van Gisbergen up six spots to seventh. Uh, and Scott Pye also up six spots to eighth. He did really well. Uh, they both did pretty well with their strategies. Nick Perkat with a really weird decision by his crew to pit him out of fifth place. He was in fifth place behind David Reynolds. Safety car comes out. They choose to pit him with 10 laps to go onto fresh tyres. And at the time, it dropped him into 12th. And I was like, there's no way he's getting back up to 5th. There's no way he's getting back up to 5th. Especially at Winton. It's just not easy to pass at Winton. Um, and it really dumb decision by his team. Really stupid. Um, I was shocked when I saw him in. I really was. Because it's just... Like, maybe they were expecting everybody else to pit as well. Um, but it didn't happen. You know, why would you? If you see the person in front of you pit at Winton, you go, great, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> um, when you make a decision like that, you're really banking on everybody else behind you pitting. And maybe they thought they were because they did bring in everyone on, on the BJR team. They all went into pit. Uh, but Nick Perkat was in fifth spot and he really should have just stuck there. He really should have just consolidated that position because uh, he was in a really good position. He really was. He would have been up seven spots from his beginning. Uh, but Chaz Mostert in 10th, Andre Hungartner in 11th, uh, he had a good race, Chaz Mostert did not, uh, Mostert went off on lap 1, all on his own, just made a mistake and went off the track, and then he went off again on <laughs> lap 2, straight afterwards, um, it was pretty shocking actually, he's, such, he's, a, he's a really good driver, uh, it was pretty, I was amazed to see him go off on his own mistakes, and then he also got a 15 second penalty, um, for contact, I don't even remember who with, I really should, um, hold on, I've got it here, um, that's right here, contact with James Courtney, um, and that gave him a, I believe it was 15 second time penalty as well, so he was really, really, really on the back foot, so a, a recovery up to 10th was a good drive from him, um, and some good use of strategy by his team, he took advantage of that safety car and bolted on some new tires um, and he really made his way up through the field so good on him um, Tim Slade in a 12th position up 7 spots James Courtney in 13th Chris Piffer the fill-in the fill-in for Richie Stanaway up 11 spots into 14th position what an amazing race he had I didn't even notice him and no one talked about him he was right at the back of the field and they just played his strategy to perfection absolute perfection um when everybody else pitted for the safety car they left him out he gained a bunch of spots and he just defended and he only let um he let what i think percat mustard slade and courtney by and that was it that was it he ended up in 14th 63 points to his name after one race in supercars amazing drive from him especially considering he was just a ring in that day they caught him up and they were like jump in the car and he was like whoa okay you know so uh excellent job i can't excellent job uh todd hazelwood in 15th up five spots good job from him uh, macaulay jones in 16th anton down 11 spots to 17th he had contact with rick kelly so rick kelly uh no um Anton, <laughs> there we go, those are the words, these are my words, Anton uh, understeered into the side of Rick Kelly, um, earned himself another 15 second penalty, they were really big fans of the 15 second penalty this weekend, um, and Rick ended up retiring anyway, so it didn't matter too much, uh, disappointing for him, but uh, Anton is that far down because he had a 15 second time penalty, unfortunate, but it, he did deserve a penalty, he did just sort of run him off the track and 
Rick Red bun- uh, lost a bunch of positions, and it was Anton's fault. He just understeered into him, caught a bunch of curve, and just drove into the side of him. You can't do that. Uh, Jacobson in 18th, Golding in 19th, Jack LeBrock in 20th, Jack Smith in 21st, and uh, not in last. Um, but he was a lap down with Mark Winterbottom in 22nd after he uh, received another 15 second time penalty for running into Simona at turn one. So Winterbottom just came out of the pits. Simona's on hot tires coming around the outside. Um, and they they run into each other and Simona goes off. Uh, Winterbottom gets a puncture, so he had to limp back to the pits, put a new tire on, and he also got a 15 second penalty. Um, and uh, ruined Simona's race as well because she ended up in 23rd. Um, really not her weekend. Um... But Winterbottom seemed to think that it wasn't his fault and he didn't deserve a penalty because uh, she turned into him. Um, but I've watched the I've watched the video a couple of times and it looks pretty clear to me that Winterbottom was understeering. Uh, he had too much speed going into that corner and he would have hit her anyway, uh, even if she'd left him oodles of room. I'm pretty sure he would have ran into her anyway um, because he was just carrying a little bit too much speed. And that's fine. These things happen, you know. They're on cold tires, these things happen. Uh, shame about both their races being ruined by that, but that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. And not classified. Will Davison for just his car just stopping, <laughs> which that sucked because he was in a really good spot. Um, in fact, everyone in Tickford except for uh, Mostert, really good weekend. Um, well, not weekend, but really good sun- Sunday for most of them. Um, so shame for him. He was in the top ten. Um, I believe he had a transaxle transaxle failure, and his car just stopped. Um, and Rick Kelly also not classified with an engine failure. Um, they went out on lap thirty four for Rick Kelly and fifty six for Will Davison to the championship. And I don't even want to read it out because it's too depressing. Um, Scott McLaughlin in first, of course, with one thousand six hundred and forty six points. Uh, followed by Fabian Coulthard, 244 points behind. We went into this weekend and Fabian was 144 points behind. Now he's 244 points behind. Remember that one race win is worth 150 points. So that means that Fabian, that Scotty has a lead over second place of more than a whole race weekend. Scotty could retire from the next race and Fabian could come first. And Scotty would still be ahead in the championship by a comfortable margin. Um, yeah, <laughs> Scotty's been killing it, but it is depressing from a from a fan perspective, a neutral perspective to see. Um, but you never know; the season is long. Uh, we're not too far into it, so cross your fingers. Let's hope some drama happens. It'll come back to us. Uh, Shane Van Gisbergen, surprisingly, is still in third. Uh, another 415 points back from Scott McLaughlin. Um, so unless Red Bull have some kind of miracle weekend, I don't f- see them up there, really. Uh, David Reynolds in fourth. Um, not far behind Shane. Only 10 points behind Shane. Uh, Jamie Winkup, another 50 points behind David. Chaz Mostert, 10 points behind Jamie Winkup. Nick Perkett is in there, too. Good on him in seventh. Uh, Cameron Waters in 8th, he should be higher up, but he's had all sorts of car problems, unfortunately, for him. Uh, Will Davison takes a blow to his championship standings with that DNF on Sunday, but he's still in ninth. And Tim Slade rounds out the top 10. Uh, Mark Winterbottom doing better than his... Uh, doing better than Lee Holdsworth, who, if you remember, swapped places. Uh, Lee Holdsworth used to be in Mark Winterbottom's team, and Mark Winterbottom used to be in the car that Lee Holdsworth is now in. Uh, with Mark Winterbottom in 11th and Lee Holdsworth in 12th. Anton in 13th. Uh, James Courtney in 14th. Heimgartner, the highest place of the Nissans in 15th. Uh, Scott Pye in 16th. Todd Hazelwood in 17th. Rick Kelly in 18th. James Golding in 19th. Simona in 20th. Um, Jack LeBrock in 21st, which is not bad, actually, considering that he's been quite quiet this season. Uh, Macaulay Jones in 22nd, Gary Jacobson in 23rd, Richie Stanaway in 24th and also missing a race, so he's naturally going to be on the back foot now. Um, although even after missing a whole race, he's only in last by 10 points, so he's got a, he's got a, uh, quite a bit of spots he can make up quite quickly there. 
Uh, Jack Smith now with two rounds to his name has 144 points in total. Uh, Tim Blanchard with one round to his name has 93. And Chris Piffer after one single race has 63 points. All right, so now to the team's championship. And you already know who's in first. Uh, DJR in first place with 2,988 points and 60 point penalty to their name. Uh, but who doesn't have penalty points to their names? Pretty much everybody does. Including Red Bull Holden Racing Team, a whole 649 points behind. Also with 60 points to that penalty points to their name. Uh, Erebus, nearly a thousand points down. I'll say exactly how much it is because it gets quite close after this. Erebus, 952 points back, or 2,036 points to their name in total with a 30 uh, penalty with 30 penalty points to serve. BJR, one of the few teams to not have penalty points at 2,029 points. Doing very well uh, this season, actually. Um, Tickford Racing, um, the two denominations being Lee Holdsworth, number five car, and Chaz Mostert's number 55 car. 2,018 points for them, also with no penalties to their name. Uh, Cameron Waters and... Um, and Will Davison's uh, portion of Tickford Racing in 6th position with 1,938 points with 30 penalty points. And then we've got a bit of a larger gap back to Walkinshaw and Dreddy, 1,529. Followed by Andre Heimgartner and Rick Kelly's uh, portion of Kelly Racing with 1,440. Gary Rogers Motorsport with 1,210. Uh, Simona and Gary Jacobson uh, with 1,083. Winterbottom, all by himself, with 826. Uh, Ty Hazelwood with 673. Jack LeBlock with 496. One point clear of Macaulay Jones with 495. Um, next, next event is the Darwin Triple Crown events. Um, happening... I see that right. 17 days from now is what the, uh, is what the clock says on the website. Um, that looks like a three weeks away to me. Excuse me, I'm just reading things. Um, yeah, about three weeks away. Um, so another big gap to our next event. Um, I dare say that's because the long weekend is on in between. But uh, practice begins on Friday with the first race on Saturday. Uh, again, with the three-part qualifying, which they seem to like now. And another race on the Sunday with a course, a top 10 shootout. Welcome back to the top 10 shootouts. We've missed them. Um, Darwin, classic track. Don't really need to say much about it. You've probably seen it before. Um, we've been there a million times, a billion, million, million times. And it's always a fun track to go to. Um, news. Do I have any news? I do have a little bit of news. Um, so on at Winston we had a few co-driver sessions uh, for the upcoming enduro season, and a few people have been locked in now. Aside from the ones that we already know, like Garth Tander and Craig Lowndes and uh, all that, all that good stuff, um, along with Erebus's um, Will Brown and oh, I don't remember who else was in Erebus. They got the same lineup as last year, though. Um, but, um, for Kelly Racing, uh, Bryce Forward, the current leader of the Super 2 Championship, will be partnering with Andre Heimgartner. Um, he'll be getting his, I think it's his second time, racing as a, an endurance driver. He did compete last year in the endurance races, but he was partnered with Todd Hazelwood. And remember, their car last year wasn't great, uh, so he barely registered. But this year, he's... He's also he's driving a Nissan in Super 2, and he's also driving a Nissan in the Endurance Cup. So good on him. Hopefully he shows what he can do. Uh, Dale Wood has confirmed that he is back to partner Rick Kelly. Uh, he has been there for the last uh, two years. So he is a nice, consistent driver. Um, Gary Rogers has locked in Chris Piffer and Richard Muscat, the same as last year's Endurance Cup races. Uh, Chris Piffer clearly, clearly showing uh, that he can do what he needs to do so good job to him and uh, i believe that's it for our confirmed drivers from this weekend i probably missed a couple 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but um, if you're wondering why I didn't talk about maybe some other people who were in that practice session, um, it's either because they're already confirmed as being Endurance Cup drivers, like I said before, like Garth Tander or uh, Jamie Winkup. Not Jamie Winkup. He's a full-time driver, Kendall. Um, Craig Lowndes. Craig Lowndes or Garth Tander. Already confirmed drivers. Um, as is like Alexander Prima. Those sorts of people already confirmed. Um, these are just people who haven't been confirmed yet. Um, and there might have been some people on that field um, that I didn't talk about. That's because they are not, they were either not confirmed yet. Uh, they might be suspected, but they're not confirmed yet. Or they were just trying them out uh, to see how they would do. Um, so if you're wondering why I didn't talk about anyone in particular, that's why. Um... Some interesting things from Nick Perkat's side of the garage. Uh, he explains that when he pitted under the yellow flag, he didn't even know he was in fifth place. <laughs> so apparently the team radioed in and told him to pit. He asked him several times if he was sure. And he said later on that if he knew that he was in fifth place, he would have ignored the order. How did he not know what position he was in is a bit shocking to me. Did he not, no one tell him what position he was in? <laughs> um, I just thought that was funny um, yeah it's a real shame for him I don't know why they pitted him um, but that's the way it goes sometimes um, so yeah our next event is Darwin as I said before uh, looking forward to it it's always a good event nice sunny Darwin especially this time of year uh, winter <laughs> this time of year in winter it's okay in summer I don't like it so much but in winter it's alright um so I guess the next time I see you will be in three weeks after the Darwin event. We'll have plenty to talk about there. Top 10 shootouts, two races to look forward to. I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully you are as well. But until then, I'll see you on the next episode of the V8 Supercast Fancast. My name has been Kendall Abita Kendall, and I will see you next time.